Hey everyone. Whether you're painting in a cartoony style or a more realistic style or anything in between, it's your grasp of the fundamentals that are really going to drive the quality of your work. And over the years, I've found that having some basic blender skills is super useful for being able to quickly set up and study all kinds of lighting scenarios. These are references you could set up in the real world, but with 3D, you have it all at your fingertips. So in this video, I'll step you through setting up some lighting scenarios in Blender that we can study from. I've provided a file for everyone called lighting.blend. Go ahead and open that. And it's just this basic photographic set kind of thing. You can use your middle mouse button to orbit the camera, scroll your mouse wheel back and forth to move in and out, and shift middle click will move left and right. Let's add an object to our set here. Go up to add, mesh, and I like the icosphere, which is a sphere, but with visible planes. Now it's buried halfway in the ground, so let's move it up. Push T to enable the toolbar, and you can use this move tool right here. You'll see the three axes, X, Y, and Z, and you can pick one and pull along that axis. But you don't have to select the move tool. You can visually reference the X, Y, and Z directions up here, then push G, and then the axis you want to move on, so G, Y, G, X, and you can move the object that way. I'm going to make myself a custom view by dragging up here to create a new window. Then in that new window, I'll push numpad zero to snap to a camera view. The camera is already set up in the scene for you. And I can use the same mouse and keyboard commands to move my camera independent of my other view. I'll use my middle mouse button to scroll to the end of this upper bar here and click this icon, which activates the rendering engine. So we're seeing a rendered view, which is just black right now because we have no lights. So we'll go up here to add light. Blender offers different types of lights, but we'll start with a point light. And our render view shows something happening. But with the light selected, I'll push G and Z to move the light up on the Z axis. And we've got a very dim scene. Now, the cool thing is Blender works in real world measurements. With the light selected, if I click on this light bulb icon, we can see that this light bulb is 10 watts. That's not very strong. A typical household incandescent light bulb is 60 watts. So let's change this to 60. Our light is more powerful, but it's still pretty dim. That's because our sphere is pretty large in comparison. I'll push N to activate this info menu. And you can see down here, our sphere has a two meter circumference. If I were setting this scene up for real with a 60 watt bulb, I'd want my sphere to be way smaller. So I'll push S and scale the ball while watching the values to arrive at a more reasonable size. Something I could light with a 60 watt bulb. With the sphere selected, I'll push numpad period to center the view on that sphere. And it's floating right now, so I'll push G and Z to move it back down to the ground, adjusting my views as I need. Now the fun begins. I can grab the light source, and once again I'll push G then Z to move the light down on the Z axis. And we get real time updates in our rendered view. But there is something unrealistic here, that cast shadow is too sharp. That's because the default point light is an infinitely small point in space, which is not how a real light bulb is. A real light bulb has an area to it. So to mimic that, I'll simply increase the light's radius. And you can see the shadow softening as we do. We'll explore this further a bit later in the video. Now, I like those rough planes on the sphere because it's a reminder that everything in real life essentially boils down to planes that face different directions and therefore receive light differently. But you could select that sphere, right click and say shade smooth. I'll keep playing with the light. And if I want my planes back, just select the sphere, right click and say shade flat. All right, switching over to Photoshop now, I'm just throwing a angled strokes filter over the render just to knock down those harsh planes a little bit. And yeah, what follows now is a straightforward digital painting study. So I've painted many balls on my channel, but it's not just about painting a ball. I want to capture the subtle sense of illumination that's in that render. There's something warm and, I don't know, charming about it. And I think it's here in the reflected light, which is what I'm painting now in my study. There's a pretty big difference between the bounce light coming from the light source and bouncing off the ground versus the ambient light coming down from the environment. There's two main differences that I can see. One is warm and one is cool. And that's organized logically. The bounce light hitting the ball from underneath comes from the warm light, so it's warmer and the ambient light hitting the top of the shadow side of the sphere comes from our environment, which I set to be cooler in Blender. So if you noticed, I went for that relationship right away in my study because it was germane to the lighting. The light side of the ball, which I'm painting now, 
ironically, is much less important. I mean, it's important in the sense that it has to be there for light versus shadow, but there's not a whole lot of, let's say, information going on in the light side of this ball. It mostly tells us where the light source is physically and the light source's color temperature, which in this case is warmer than the environment. Lastly, I'll get the slight fall off that's happening on the floor due to the light losing intensity as distance increases. And here's my final study. All right, back in Blender, let's give this sphere a color. To do that, go to the materials icon here, then click on this base color swatch and pick whatever color you like. This slider here, roughness, is pretty important. It controls how microscopically smooth the material is. Setting it lower here makes this material look like a billiard ball or something. Now I'll select the light source and click on the light bulb icon, and I'll change the type of light to area. An example of an area light is these classic studio lights. You know, they emit light from a fairly large area. And as such, they tend to be a little more diffuse than, say, a point light. I also just changed the color of the light here to make it a cool light. Okay, because this is an area light, we can change the area that it takes up. First, we can set its shape, which I'll leave as a square. Then you can adjust the physical size of the panel of light. The larger the size, the more diffuse the light. You'll see this here in the softening of that cast shadow, which makes sense because light rays are coming from a greater area. This is something photographers learn on day one. But as digital painters, we approach image making differently, and this is not something I think a lot of us do learn on day one. Okay, remember a second ago I was talking about roughness? Well, here's what happens when the roughness is at zero. Mirror-like reflections. In fact, the highlight is a reflection of the area light. That's pretty cool. With increased roughness, you can see what happens. We still have a highlight. It just becomes diffused by all that microscopic irregularity. I've been making in-depth digital painting courses for years now. I noticed that if I just combined all my courses together, I'd have a comprehensive digital painting curriculum. So that's exactly what I did. With the Digital Painting Mastery System, you'll get these eight courses that all complement each other and build well-rounded skills. Plus, you'll get these three bonus perks, which include community access for live critiques. The Digital Painting Mastery System is available now at a special launch price. It's $100 off until October 8th. If your goal is to get good faster, it's for you. You can find it at marcobucciartstore.com. All right, I'm going to go for a lighting scenario here that uses two lights which is something that causes problems often in digital paintings. To duplicate an object in Blender, including a light, select it and press Shift D. Then I'll go ahead and change the color of each light. Then I'll just dial in the strength of each light, the angle, the roughness of the sphere, until something looks good. Doing my painting now, I want to set up the ground plane. This is interesting because we have two lights of conflicting temperatures, kind of fighting for dominion on that ground plane. So I'm just dialing in that subtle transition from warm on the left to cool on the right. Fairly neutral colors too, because those two lights are fighting against each other chroma-wise. All right, the sphere comes in on a new layer. I've locked that layer's transparency. Now, the main way to sell two light sources is get the shadow between the two lights correct, which is where I'm starting here. Then get the temperatures of either light on either side correct as well. The light on the left is warm, and the red base color is warm, so there's not gonna be a huge color shift. It is a yellowish light, so that red might turn a little bit orange in the light, but on the right side, it's a cool light. It's actually quite cool, meaning the light's color has a lot of saturation in it. So I'm arriving at this purple because that's what happens when you mix blue and red. The cast shadows are really interesting. First of all, there's two of them because there's two lights, but they swap temperatures. That's because both lights are also lighting up the cast shadows, imparting their color as they do. And here's a little digital painting trick. I do this a lot in my paintings, just adding a bit of a glow into the dark background. This is a light blooming effect, as photographers would call it, and you place it where the light is the most concentrated. Now, I overdid it here for demonstration purposes. Keep this more subtle in your actual work. You'd be surprised, though. A little of it goes a long way. All right, I'm working some reflected light into that shadow, but it still has to remain shadow. That's a question of value. Just making sure your shadow group is separate from your lights. Adding some highlights now, getting a medium to low roughness. And now you know what I mean when I say roughness. And just massaging that reflected light in the shadow area, making sure that there's evidence of reflected light from both light sources. 
which is a more subtle way of selling the dual light effect. And there we go. All right, take a look at this. I'm just gonna move this around until I find a good shadow pattern. And don't worry, I will show you how to set this up. But first, let's do the painting. Just gonna set the stage first, put myself in the ballpark of these colors and values. And let's block in the major forms. Here's the red ball. And doing a quick little line drawing here for the box, holding shift to give myself some nice straight lines. And I'll block in the shadow plane because that one doesn't have any of the dappled light because it's in shadow. And I'll just pick a plane and dive in. This top plane has some foreshortened dappled light on it. I think it'd be very easy in this scene to make a big mess right away. You know, to kind of look at that dappled light pattern and just think you could do it with, you know, random brush strokes. Or, you know, get out some scatter brush you might have and just throw that everywhere. But I would submit that that kind of approach would neither work compositionally nor lead to a good design. So I'm kind of going object by object and even within that plane by plane and getting the pattern working, which kind of builds confidence as I go, because I'm trying to understand the visual pattern here. I'm trying to make non-repetitive choices in terms of shape, size, the hardness or softness of edge. And some of that is copying the reference outright. And some of it is just looking at the reference and making my own similar decisions. Switching topics for a quick second though. One thing that all of these renders have made very clear is the presence of ambient occlusion. That's my favorite value. Simply put, it's the darkest part of a shadow. These areas right in here. I purposely made that box floating off the ground to show how the ambient occlusion is the area where the least amount of reflected light or ambient light can make its way in, thereby making it the darkest part of your shadow and the darkest value in your painting. Shouts to my community members who have to take a shot every time I bring it up. Yeah, ambient occlusion is my favorite value. I have a whole video on it. If you haven't seen it, you can check it out here, link on the screen. So anyway, I've been working on these dappled light shapes, and I think there's two keys to doing this. First is keep the sizes of your shapes varied. That'll help ensure it looks more natural, like shadows cast by leaves. At this point, I abandoned the reference because so many of these shapes are my own now. The other thing I'm doing though is I'm working hard to soften these edges. That's because the leaves that are casting these shadows are quite far away. And cast shadows get softer edges the further away they are from the object casting them. And when I soften edges, I try and use different methods to do it. I'll use an airbrush, I'll use a smudge tool, I'll use some scumbling. That helps keep the brushwork feeling fresh and not redundant. And there we go, there's the final study. Hope everyone has a good time trying this and oh yeah, how to set this up in Blender. This is where we left off. I'll delete one of the lights. Then I'll go up to edit preferences, click on add-ons, search for the word node up here and make sure this node wrangler add-on is on. Then I'll click on my area light and go into the light bulb icon and change the light to a spotlight. I can move the spotlight where I want it to go and push shift T and click on the ball to point it there. Go ahead and fool around with the spotlight settings. You can control the softness of the cone, the size of the cone and other things like that. To create the dappled light, go up here and go to Shader Editor. That'll change our 3D window into this window. Click on Use Nodes. And if your light is selected, this will pop up. Click on this box labeled Emission and push Control T. And this is where the Node Wrangler comes in. It makes these other boxes pop up. On this Image Texture node, you can click Open and then go ahead and find the texture map that I also provided in the video description. And there it is. This is what you would call a gobo in stage lighting. The nice thing here is we can customize this by playing with the sliders on the mapping node. You can scale it and position it. I'll move the camera in close to show you one last thing. See how soft those edges are? With the light selected, you can use this radius slider to change that and, you know, dial it in however you want. And that's about it for today. Hopefully you can see how simple yet powerful these tools can be to help your painting. If you want to advance your painting even more, check out MarcoBucciArtStore.com for my premium content, including the all-new Digital Painting Mastery System.